Namaste and greetings. I, Faza Mahajan, researcher at IMPRI, Impact and Policy Research Institute, Prabhav, Imniti Anusandhan Sansthan, Nai Delhi, extend my warmest welcome to you all to IMPRI Web Policy Talk. We are gathered today for a panel discussion on defense, foreign policy, and union budget 2023-24. This discussion is organized by the Center for International Relations and Strategic Studies as a part of IMPRI Web Policy Talk Series, The State of International Affairs, Hashtag Diplomacy Dialogue. This discussion is a part of IMPRI's third annual series of thematic deliberations and analysis of Union Budget Financial Year 2023-24 being organized from February 2nd to 7th, 2023. I welcome all of you to this enlightening deliberation and thank you for tuning into this discussion. Our moderator for today, today's discussion is Dr. Simi Mehta, CEO and Editorial Director, IMPRI. We welcome you, ma'am. The panelists for today's discussion are Professor Sanjukta Bhattacharya, retired professor, international relations, Jadavpur University, Kolkata. Major General Dr. P. K. Chakravarti, BSM retired strategic thinker on security issues, Professor Swaran Singh, Professor and Chairperson, Center for International Politics, Organization and Disarmament, Jawaharlal Nehru University, and Mr. Robinder and Sachdev, President, the Image, Image India Institute, New Delhi, founder, the Lemonade Party. We welcome all of you. Now, without any further ado, let us start the program. It is my honor to invite Dr. Simi Mehta to start the program. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you, Fiza. And good evening, and I welcome all of you to the web policy discussion on defense, foreign policy, and union budget 2023-24 as part of the diplomacy dialogues being organized by the IMPRI Center for International Relations and Strategic Studies. It is a delightful opportunity for me to be hosting this panel discussion. Defense and foreign policy are indispensable part of the Indian economy and India's development, and hence a discussion on what the budgetary allocations for these areas have been made in the budget proposed presented by the finance minister, Ms. Nirmala Sitaraman, on 1st February 2023 becomes very important. This is especially because one needs to fathom the implications of these allocations towards the realization of the Amrit Kal in the truest sense of the term. Today's panel discussion will explore how India's geopolitics could be affected or if India can drive its geopolitics as per it, its own terms. So without any further ado, let's get started. I would request Samriddhi from our team to just present a brief overview of the budgetary allocations in these sectors. Over to you, Samriddhi. Good evening. I'm Samriddhi, researcher at INPRI. Let me present to you the key features of the budget pertaining to defense, foreign policy, and external affairs at this August gathering. The overall allocation for defense is 5.94 lakh crore, up from 5.25 lakh crore in financial year 2022-2023, a hike of 13%. In terms of share, the defense is 13.18% 1, of the overall budget. For the armed forces, the Indian Air Force got the largest share among the three services at Rs 57,000 crore, a 3.6% hike from FY 2022-2023. The Indian Army was allocated Rs 37,000 crore, a hike of 15.6% from last year. And the Indian Navy, Navy's capital budget was Rs 52,000 crore, with an annual increase of 10.6%. With a 43% hike to Rs 5,000 crore in financial year 2023 to 2024, as against Rs 3,500 crore in FY 2022-2023, there is a clear thrust towards infrastructure strengthening in the border areas. The second high highlight would be the increase in the non salary revenue operational allocation, witnessing a rise of 44% from Rs. 62,431 62, crore in budget estimate 
2022-23 to rupees 90,000 crore in budget estimate 2023-24. This is report reportedly being done to enhance military and security preparedness given the current challenges. The enhanced allocation in the budget would also cater to training aids and stimulators for Agni Veers and ensure that they achieve the set standards of training for induction in the defense forces. Exempt, exempt, exempt EEE status has been allocated to the Agni Veer Fund in 2023-24 budget. The research, innovation, and technological development sector of defense have also garnered centrality in the budget with DRDO allocated rupees 23,264 crore in budget estimate 2023-24, a 9% spike. In the innovation sector, IDEX and DTIS have been allocated rupees 116 crore and rupees 45 crore respectively, representing an enhancement of 93% for IDEX and 95% for DTIS over 2022-23. This will fulfill the Ministry of Defense's vision to leverage ideas from bright young minds across the country. I would also like to highlight the 15.5% increase in the defense pension budget from rupees 1.1 lakh crore in budget estimate 2022-23 to rupees 1.3 lakh crore in budget estimate 2023-24. The government's commitment to transforming healthcare outreach to our veterans' defense budget 2023-24 registers a notable increase of 52% in the allot allotment for ex-servicemen contributory health scheme, ECHS, with budget estimate allocation of Rs. 5,431 crore in FY23-2023-24 against Rs. 3,582 crore in financial year 2022-23. This enhancement will ensure cashless health services and improve service delivery to our veterans and their dependents across India. Summing up, we have seen a rise in budget allocation for the defense sector with a focus on R&D and innovation, a concerted effort towards non-revenue operational allocation, and what seems to be a genuine step towards modernization <clears throat> through greater push towards research and innovation. As India embarks on its journey as the chair for the G20 and Shanghai Cooperation Organization Presidency, let us take a look into the budget to the Ministry of External Affairs. With a total of Rs 18,050 crores in the union budget for 2023-24 and an increase of 4.64%, we can note the priority given to the G20 chair. A fund of over 990 crore has been allocated to the same. India is also on its way to organizing the G20 summit in September this year. With the budgetary allocation and engagement being assigned to this chairmanship, we can discern the essence it holds to the Indian foreign policy. Looking further into the MEA budget allocation with respect to India's neighborhood, the Development Assistance Fund has, however, remained largely the same, with some witnessing marginal rise and others cuts. Maldives, owing to the green Mail connectivity project and Bhutan are a few to retain an increase in allocation, while many like Nepal, Sri Lanka, and Mauritius have been have seen some decline. As per the MEA budget statement, the aid budget has fallen from Rs. 5,476 crore to Rs. 5,408 crore in 2023-2024. Thank you. We look forward to learning from our esteemed guest and panelists and deliberation. Over to you, Dr. Mehta. Thank you. Thank you very much, Samriddhi, for putting uh, this <laughs> wonderful and crisply putting up all these uh, figures for all of us. So uh, let us begin with our uh, panelists and uh, delve straight into the discussion based on perhaps uh, the numbers would be revolving around what you have just presented. I would, um, uh, Professor Sanjukta Bhattacharya, welcome. Good evening. Evening. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, ma'am. If you could just bring your uh, screen, uh -huh. the laptop screen towards yourself. Yeah, we could see okay, more clearly. Yes. Okay. Thank you. So, ma'am, if we can begin with you, um, and if you could give us um, your sense of um, how the budget 23-24 uh, implies on the 
foreign policy, especially with respect to the India's neighborhood first policy, it would be great. And also, as Samridhi has mentioned, there have been some commitments with a marginal increase in, uh, towards some countries, while some have seen some decree decline. So if you could just throw some light on that. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you. In fact, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Mehta, and also the Center for International Relations and uh, Strategic Studies uh, of IMPRI uh, for inviting me and greetings to my co-panelists. Uh, now, this uh, basically uh, budget, union budget is presented around uh, this year, every year. Uh, and this ensures the efficient allocation of uh, available resources. What is important here is available resources. Uh, uh, the operative words are these because while many ministries may have a to-do list, it's not always possible to do everything that one wishes to because of limited resources. Now, uh, the, it, there are some things. The UN budget works in tandem with the five-year plan, uh, for instance. Therefore, it priori prioritizes certain things over others when it comes to allocation. Uh, also, uh, the, uh, the government of the present uh, basically has certain missions and visions, okay? And in fact, obviously will prioritize certain things over others. For instance, in fact, the current uh, government, we talk about Atman and Bharat. So basically here you find SM, uh, 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 MSMEs, okay, are being the same. Even in the defense budget, you find MSMEs uh, have been emphasized, okay? Uh, so basically there are certain priorities. Now, uh, also, what is important is that the union budget uh, promotes overall macroeconomic growth and inclusive uh, development for all sections of the society and the economy. Uh, the key sections have always been health, education, agriculture, infrastructure development, internal security, environment, uh, also poverty alleviations, etc. And so therefore, in fact, these are prioritized in almost every budget. Now, at the same time, India has this goal of becoming a developed economy by 2047, which is, uh, well, the uh, 100th year of independence. And it also wants to become a global power and a global pair, which are, of course, very uh, laudable. And therefore, what you find is the allocations uh, to the Ministry of External Affairs and the Defense Ministry uh, are becoming more and more important. Now, what you must remember, and what, in fact, uh, uh, Dr. Mehta was talking about, uh, well, the economy is very important, and allocation, therefore, is also very important. The economy is the currency that powers international relations, and the GDP uh, is the pivotal numeric of global influence. Uh, India must be economically strong within to be influential abroad. Uh, it is economic power that allows a nation to build military cooperation, capabilities and in fact enhance its influence abroad. In fact, it's India's economic rise uh, which made it possible for its policymakers to envision India as a major uh, pole in the evolving global order. And today, we, as was pointed out, uh, India holds a presidency for the G20 and the G20 summit will be held here. Uh, it also is holds a presidency for the SCO, the Shanghai Cooperation Council uh, organization, and the basically uh, uh, is the, uh, holds the chairmanship for the Wassenaar Agreement. So uh, as a result, it is a global leader in its own right. And therefore, what you find, of course, is uh, there is a slight increase in the allocation for the Ministry of External Affairs. Uh, but out of uh, the sum that was mentioned, 990 crores is set aside towards the G20. Primarily, in fact, the importance of the G20, uh, because the G20 represents 85% of global GDP. It represents over 75% of worldwide trade. And in fact, it covers over two thirds of the world's population. So therefore it is uh, very important uh, in its own right. Now, uh, well, Certain, uh, the budget actually, uh, the other thing that was asked of me by Dr. Mehta was, uh, well, why certain allocations have increased and why certain allocations have decreased. Now, primarily, uh, as was mentioned, uh, neighborhood first policy, and this has been promoted, but what one finds is that 
apart from Bhutan, uh, which of course is India's neighbor, uh, uh, where in fact 41.04% uh, of MEA's development assistance uh, is going in the coming year. Uh, and uh, for Maldives, uh, which is getting about ru rupees 400 crore, uh, all the other neighborhood countries, like for instance, Bangladesh, okay, uh, Sri Lanka, uh, Mauritius, Nepal, Seychelles, uh, the allocations for these countries are declining, or right? they are lesser than in the previous year. Uh, for Afghanistan, we do not recognize basically the Taliban, but yet, in fact, it remains at 200 crores. And the reason, of course, uh, for remaining at 200 crores is because this is supposed to be for the people. Of, uh, it, it actually keeps the door open for diplomacy. So this is uh, the reason that is kind of done there. Now, why increase for Bhutan, 41.04% for Bhutan? Primarily, one must see it in the context of India's foreign policy. All this must be seen in the context of uh, India's foreign policy. What is being prioritized and what is not, or what will be prioritized and what will not be prioritized, uh, it's basically from the estimated budget that we see. Uh, because Bhutan, uh, China's threat to Bhutan is increasing, and of course, consequently, uh, to India. So basically, the assistance that is given there for infrastructure development, et cetera, uh, well, one can understand it in that context. Maldives is in the IOR, or right, as such, where, again, India is trying, uh, trying to basically increase its impact, okay? So Maldives also, but why not Seychelles, et cetera? If you look at the countries where it has gone down, one also sees that, uh, uh, well, basically, uh, in these countries where India's development assistance is going down, China's development assistance or China's assistance, okay, has been going up, okay. Now, whether this has anything to do with India's assistance going down is something that maybe my co-panelists can throw light on, but I have a feeling that, well, it is prioritizing Bhutan and Maldives over the other countries, uh, so far as a neighborhood uh, uh, first policy is concerned. Now, uh, the other thing that I want to point, uh, point out is that also we are looking at neighborhood first policy. What about look east policy uh, or act east policy? Now, here one hardly sees, uh, you know, uh, earmarked money or data such for Southeast Asian projects or something like that. One sees instead that uh, allocation of funds for the Nalanda University, the construction, ongoing construction in the Nalanda U University has increased. And basically, uh, this is being kind of touted as part of the Look East policy, uh, but one does not see uh, other things over here. So far as West Asia is concerned, uh, the money for Chabahar port, port, okay, that actually still remains at 100 crores. Now, Chabahar port uh, is one of the most important items so far as India's foreign policy is concerned because it opens the door not only to the West uh, to West Asia, but also basically to Central Asia and to Afghanistan from the other side. So trade, et cetera, uh, through Chabahar Port. And yet, in fact, there's no increase in the money allocated for Chabahar Port. Now, this one, if one looks deeper into that, primarily one can look at basically Iran's relations with the United States or other US relations with Iran, US relations with India. And in that context, a certain wariness or it as such of increasing, okay, uh, allocation uh, over there. Now, the other thing that one sees in the MEA is basically uh, money which is allocated for the passport seva project 2.0, okay, where you find an allocation of 1,002.76 crore and e-migrate version 2.0, okay where again there's been an increase now this well the passport or right so far uh, as the passport seva project is concerned this will upgrade technological uh, uh, well it's a technological application of the passport services and e-migrate basically uh, is technological upscaling of services to facilitate uh, worker outflow from the country now well digitization and technological upgradation of course is part of uh, prime minister modi's all right, overall uh, outlook. But what also one uh, needs to notice is that elections, of course, the entire budget, whether it's for foreign policy or basically for uh, uh, defense or well, other sectors which are not discussing today, 
uh, we find that there's a people first policy over here, okay, because of the elections which are going to soon be here. Now, what I'm going to talk about here just for the next few minutes is that there's little innovation uh, uh, so far as foreign policy uh, allocations are concerned. It's only basically a question of increasing or decreasing allocation for ongoing projects and items, and not really money set aside for something new. Now, here I'd like to point out that one of the focus of the Modi government has been Africa. Now, here, this continent, I need to point out, of course, that Africa is resource rich and in the future, uh, well, it's going to become more and more important. Lots of countries are interested primarily in Africa and India too is, of course, increasing its footprint uh, over there. But uh, well, apart from China, there are other players also who, which aren't. Now, the, po uh, the point that I want to make is that money should have been set aside for increasing the number of embassies and consulates. There are 54 countries, uh, about 28 consulates and uh, embassies are there, and they're building some more they're, uh, new ones. Also, there's a lack of connectivity with the African continent. Most of our travel routes are through the Middle East. Okay, direct connectivity is missing. Now, certain countries like South Africa, uh, South Africa, all right, there you find connectivity, plus, in fact, embassies and consulates in more than one city, but certain other countries are completely bypassed. Now, man, if you're going to build up relations with, uh, uh, with the AU, with African countries, with basically uh, the RECs in Africa, we need actually to build more consulates and uh, embassies to have more uh, foreign diplomats over there. So basically you find this ignored. Now in the defense sector also, one finds this kind of lacunae because what I find is that although there has been increase in the defense allocation, uh, it is heavy on salaries and pensions and very light on research and development. Now, uh, this reflects old fashioned thinking, um, uh, basically, uh, especially in the context of the changing uh, global defense scenario, uh, there is a problem over here. Although there is an increase or rate as such of 16%, from the last year's union budget. And when you look at basically the first union budget of 2014-2015 of uh, Prime Minister Modi, there is almost a 100% jump because the defense budget then was something like 2.24 lakh crores. Now, of course, it's 5.93 lakh crores, okay? Uh, but if you look at the content, now everyday expenditure and salaries and pensions form the bulk of the defense budget of FY 2024, comprising about 68% of the total outlay, while the provision for defense capital expenditure is only around rupees 1.62 lakh crores, which includes equipment procurement, armed forces modernization, upgradation of existing systems and equipment, etc. In fact, while the defense capex is around 1.62 lakhs, as I mentioned, uh, 6.12 6 lakh crores that I mentioned, pension expenditure is going to be around rupees 1.38 lakh crores. Now, given the constant threats along the Pakistani border and the incremental threat on the Northern borders with China, uh, India needs to spend a lot, of, lot more on defense R&D to create relevant infrastructure uh, development and adapt modern technology. In fact, what you find is the budget planners need to realize that the changes in defense technology uh, are there and they're there for good and they need to adapt, okay? Uh, especially if you look basically at the Ukraine war. Now, uh, the Gulf War of 1991 and the Afghanistan War of 2001 used new technology. And in fact, the successes of the United States were, and, uh, uh, its, uh, uh, and the West basically were largely due to long range missiles and high flying bombers and satellite technology. But already, if you look at the Ukraine, Ukraine war, these are becoming passe uh, because uh, Ukraine has shot down high-flying uh, Russian aircraft with long uh, and long-range missiles, and basically they're using drones to bomb ships far off the coast. Now, emerging technologies include hypersonics, which China has, drones, loitering munitions, electronic warfare, and jamming, cyber uh, weapons, and AI capability, which would actually potentially take drone-on-drone -drone, drone warfare to new levels. In the Ukraine war, Ukraine and Russia have both used satellite drones, AI, and cyber capability in concert with traditional military hardware. Uh, NATO, in fact, has la launched a 1 billion euro investment uh, fund for innovation, for instance, uh, the use of AI for transcription and translation services to analyze intercepted 
um, communications and codes. Now the advocacy, uh, 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 what you find is, uh, Professor Bhattacharya, if you could uh, wind up and we could- Can I just take two minutes more, please? Yeah, yes. uh, I just want to say that India's defense budget should not be measured in terms of uh, quantum of funds, and but basically in terms of threat mitigation and the needs of force modernization uh, across multiple domains, especially in the context of modern missile systems, uh, like hypersonics, which have been developed by China. In September 2022, the uh, government of India basically started the PLI scheme to uh, spur manufacturing of drones and drone uh, components in India, but drone, drone technology has already gone way beyond this, underlying the significance of allocating more funds for defense R&D. Uh, now, of course, one must basically, uh, uh, before I end, just two points, okay? One is that budgeting for all sectors remains a zero-sum game. The budget outlay actually being circumscribed by total revenue the government generates via taxes and miscellaneous means and non-tax revenue, uh, okay? So which means that money is limited. Now, India's debt to GDP ratio has also been running high uh, of over 80% since 2020 and is likely to remain high uh, for some more years. Now, given this kind of economic constraint, it is impractical to ex expect the large scale allocations for foreign policy and defense to the exclusion of critical sectors like health, agriculture, infrastructure, internal security, et cetera. But at the same time, and this is my second point, okay, uh, India aims high and the objective of course uh, is to become a developed nation and a global uh, player. And what one must point out is that one cannot use foreign policy and defense policy by looking just at basically the MEA and the defense ministry uh, uh, alone, okay? One must look at basically the entire scenario holistically because, uh, well, foreign policy and defense policy does not really uh, include uh, only, all right, as such these two ministries, but ministries that deal with trade and investment, uh, import, export, clean green energy, uh, building roads and infrastructure for defense, communication systems, dual use technologies uh, involving AI, cybernetics, so ministries which deal with these, okay? Uh, so there is this kind of interrelationship uh, between ministries so far as foreign policy and defense policy are concerned. And therefore, basically, uh, one really has to look at all these, the allocations for these things and you see, there is no time here, of course, to kind of do that. Uh, but, uh, well, these relationships are there. And one must look at basically other ministries and how much has been allocated for certain things and where, or red building roads, not just tunnels, okay, uh, uh, in Arunachal Pradesh or in the northern sector, but basically also roads which will uh, tie up, all right, our borders with the interior. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am. You have really provided a wonderful uh, overview of the entire uh, discussion where we could uh, proceed towards. So since you, you know, were ending with uh, the defense allocations, I would request Major General P.K. Chakravarti to take from here as to if you could share your views on the defense budget and um, especially when the three forces had asked for more funds in their presentations to the MOD, um, yet uh, much of their demands have not been fulfilled in the numbers. Uh, how this, uh, how does uh, our national security objectives align with the overall outlay? Uh, thank you, Dr. Senmi, for inviting me. I would also like to thank Professor Bhattacharya and also the details of the data, which has already been covered about the defense budget. Well, I would put it, see, all the services always demand more, and as you Right in the beginning, it was brought out. A budget has to be, see the allotment to the overall, uh, all sectors, and defense happens to be one of them. The well, most important part is the, the, the comprehensive national power of a nation, and this is decided by the economy. If your economy is strong, everything is strong. And well, as far as the defense budget is concerned, the figures have been given. 5.94 crores, well, uh, depending on what the value of the dollar is today, they're around $70 billion, which is a very, very modest sum for any country. I mean, it's, it's approximately, as I calculated, it's 1.97% of the GDP. 
Uh, when you take Pakistan, even today, it's in dire economic straits, it has got 3.5% of the GDP being given for defense. I'm just giving you China today, it's almost the defense budget of China is very, very difficult to really find out, but it's around 350 to 400 billion dollars. And well, if you have to face a two front war, I mean, so you're facing these two fronts, which are very live Pakistan as well as China. And you have borders which have to be guarded. You've got the Indian Ocean, which is brought out very clearly, which again is an important area, which needs to be effectively dominated by the Navy. Then definitely you need cap money for it. Now, how do I place and what do we do? Well, one figure which I would like to touch upon is what is the capital outlay? It is 1.62 crores. Now, this means that our modernization, which we are on, will continue. But obviously, the pace of modernization would not be what we would like to be with the 1.62 crores as the capital outlay. So therefore, we see part of the what you call 1.62 crores would go in what is known as payment of uh, what you call for items which have already been procured or which are in the pipeline. And the rest is whatever you want in addition. Our list is huge. I mean to say it starts from aircraft carriers, strategic weapons, and last of all, most important, we must understand what does China's focus mean? China's focus is on two issues, artificial intelligence, cyber warfare. Now, when we look at defense, we really just don't look at borders. I mean, so India is today as has been rightly called a middle power. If we are a middle power, then definitely we definitely have to go well beyond our borders. And for that, our forces must have the capability to modernize, to project itself, particularly in the areas which uh, Professor Bhattacharya has said about even the areas which are in we see the act east policy in the Asia Pacific. We have already assets over there. Is the Indian Navy with the budget capable of projecting itself in the South China Sea? Is the Indian Army capable of undertaking its tasks with the budget? And the next question is the border roads have been allocated 5,000 crores, which is much higher than what was allotted earlier. Will we be today able to have the infrastructure available on our borders to face our adversary, particularly the Northern adversary? Well, these are the questions which we have to ask. And well, uh, we are, as you are aware, that I mean, say, unlike any other country, we have our forces deployed on the borders. The, uh, let's take both Eastern Ladakh and Arunachal. We have our deployments fully done. And you, just now, Professor Bhattacharya spoke about Bhutan. Well, Bhutan is not only a neighbor, but a strategic neighbor. I mean, say that, you know, when you look at the border and when you look at the Chinese domination and the way they look at it, definitely uh, we have to be ready for any contingency with regard to Bhutan. The next thing which I would like to point out is uh, the issues regarding pensions. Our defense budget includes payment to defense civilians, also includes the pensions. Now, normally they do not form a part of the defense budget, but since it's included, then definitely the higher allocation means that the one rank, one pension, which the Supreme Court has said that payments which have to be made, they have government has catered for this. The next point, which I would like to say as far as the budget is concerned, is that the details of the budget come out very, very slowly, particularly as regards field of defense is concerned. It is not an area which you know you can straight away come to know what was your what is the impact going to be. And next is the point is that while we keep on stressing on the issue of Atmanirbhar and the self and indigenization of defense products, the main issue which I would say is Atmanirbhar must lead to greater defense exports. It is not, after all, how much can the Indian Army, the Indian Navy, and the Indian Air Force consume out of all the defense uh, products which you are going to make? Unless you can stand up and your defense products find them 
place in the external market, I am afraid that the defense industry, which is the most important thing to see that the defense sector is able to thrive, will have a very, very difficult time. The next issue which I would like to say is the revenue part of the budget. The revenue part of the budget has definitely gone up. Well, this is regarding our payments and the also allocations for maintenance of it. You would agree that as far as we are concerned, we believe in that what we call 30% uh, of the equipment must be which you call state of the art. And 30% would be obsolete and about 40% would need upgradation. So the maintenance of the equipment, maintenance of buildings, maintenance of everything is extremely important. All in all, I just come to it that it would be every budget leaves the defense services with one word, innovation and prioritization. As you have correctly brought out, nobody can get everything. You cannot get the moon and you'll never get it. But yet you have to do your best. And that's where the defense forces have to you know, prioritize. A major issue which is now possibly being done by the defense forces is the process of outsourcing. A big push is being given to outsource many, many areas. If one looks at today, the Ukraine war, I think it's one area which has been totally outsourced. I wouldn't go into too much details, but I think if one, one has to look at how a war is to be fought by outsourcing, I think Ukraine is the best example. Everything has been outsourced. So the Indian Armed Forces are also looking at outsourcing. We are looking at in a big way how to bring in, you know, various sectors which are today, that is to how you can bring about greater combat strength you're well aware that for two years, we haven't carried out any recruitment. Correctly brought out that the Agni Waves have now started coming in, and this is the first part of the recruitment. But do not forget that the Agni Waves are going to last only for a limited period of time, and 25% would be there. So we would have to carry out this subject of outsourcing. We can discuss it later, which you could want to see. Another point, because this is my initial uh, this thing issue, which I would like to say is that, uh, well, uh, we have got to have a credible nuclear deterrence. Now, when you say credible nuclear deterrence, means all the three parts, the three components means land, sea, and air. Now, when you look at it, you got your missiles, which gives you a credible from the land, and also, also you got your uh, aircrafts. But as far as the sea is concerned, the minimum requirement is about three submarines, nuclear submarines, which are capable to the country to be available at any point of time. One being under refit, one ready for firing nuclear weapons, and the other going to be ready. Now, this is what is credible nuclear deterrence. If you don't have it, you are faced with two nuclear powers. While everything looks hunky-dory when we sit in the room and we you know you find it, oh no, today everything is looking okay. But whenever things go wrong, one defense forces have no time to react. They have to have response mechanisms, and these response mechanisms have to be thought about well in advance. I would leave it at that and therefore say that well, the budget is something which is available to us. It is at 1.97% of the GDP. Any country which is expecting to do well should have about 2.5% of its allocation of its budget, defense budget for the GDP. And if you don't have it, then well, it's for the defense forces now to get down to two words, innovation, prioritization, which we have been doing and we will continue doing, and we will ensure that the nation is served to the best of its ability. I think I'll just give the others a chance now. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, so innovation and prioritization. So these were the key words with which uh, Major General has ended. 
Um, I'd now request Professor Swaran Singh to take it from here and uh, give us your sense of the budget with respect to especially the major countries sir, on their defense and uh, foreign policy. And uh, where are the gaps according to you? Um, and especially when innovation and prioritization has to be there uh, for India, and uh, we do not have 2.5% of the allocation in the defense sector. So over to you. Thank you, Dr. Simi Mehta. And the compliments to your team at IMPRI Center for International Relations and Strategic Studies. Uh, I'm delighted to follow from uh, to I'm delighted to follow from Professor Sanjukta Bhattacharya, my senior colleague, and uh, of course General Chakravarti, and I look forward to listening to uh, Mr. Ravinder Sachdev also. Uh, I'm delighted to see that you have uh, clubbed defense uh, and foreign policy together, uh, because as India emerges uh, as an influential player in international system. Uh, the calibration of these two together uh, will have to be really worked upon, both in terms of, as General said, innovation and prioritization to maximize uh, influence, and not just power, but influence uh, in uh, global circles uh, as India's responsibilities move uh, from just its uh, domestic and responsibilities to regional issues to now global issues. And with that kind of uh, picture in mind, this budget was presented as the first budget of Amrit Kal, uh, which means this is kind of a first step in next uh, 25 years of period that uh, India wants to visualize itself moving forward. Uh, and at this first step, we know India today is the fifth largest economy. World Bank IMF is, you know, endorsing uh, this to be fastest growing among major economies, seven to eight uh, percent. We have a bulging middle class youth. So we talk about demographic and democratic dividend that India has in terms of its increasing global visibility, which has to gradually turn into credibility. And in that sense, I think the budget has a certain uh, way of indicating where the India should be moving forward. Uh, and, you know, the simple thing that the budget talks about uh, government spending of uh, roughly around 550 billion US dollars uh, is a reflection of the kind of uh, investment that uh, government it, through the budget is trying to uh, indicate and how it can really make the difference uh, enormously. Uh, we, I'll restrict my remarks to five, seven minutes, as you had mentioned, uh, to just basically say two to three things about both uh, defense and the foreign affairs part uh, of the budget. And there is a, a lot of talk about 13% uh, growth rate in the defense budget, which clearly indicates India's concerns about uh, long overdue modernization, uh, and of course, also the immediate uh, uh, huge forward deployment in China challenge. Uh, but as General just mentioned, it remains still uh, below 2% of GDP, and therefore it's not inordinately large. I wouldn't compare it to the percentage that Pakistan spends on uh, defense, because that's a very different kind of uh, armed forces that they have compared to most other major powers that we talk about. Uh, but yes, this upgradation of 13% growth in the budget is uh, interesting. But as was also underlined, bulk of defense budgets around the world uh, go to maintenance uh, salaries and pensions and things like these. Uh, and uh, some part of it on average around the world, about 17 to 20% is capital outlays. And what actually gives the punch ammunitions on average world defense budgets have about two to 3% of that part. And five to 7% part, depending on which country we are talking, goes into research and development. So we have to keep in mind that even when we talk about $72.6 billion of budget of India, uh, bulk of it is not going to add to the punch. 
Now, so we have to really then, as General said, focus on innovation and prioritization to add that punch because about 50 plus billion dollars are simply going into salaries and pensions. So we have to remember that how to maximize the punch would depend on prioritization and innovation. We have a large army, uh, which uh, I always say is also not just fighting on the borders. Uh, 14 lakh people are uh, well-trained, you know, physically fit, uh, morally you know, sort of robust. So when they come back to society, they add to our everyday life in enormous uh, way. So, you know, even when we pay in terms of salaries, we are creating an enormous workforce, uh, which will be useful, not just when they are serving the country as soldiers, but also when they are uh, no longer, uh, you know, sort of wearing the uniform in that sense. Second element is interesting to see if India wants to peg itself as, you know, one of the major countries around the world. And India has increasing expectations around the world in terms of whether it is UN peacekeeping or other roles that Indian armed forces are playing. Now, we have to then look at it, the gap that we have to still meet. This year only, US defense budget is about $858 billion. And Chinese say their budget is about $230 billion, but General said it could be as high as $400 billion. So when we compare our stature in terms of global power, we have to keep in mind that there are limitations that the budget still has. And of course, that would call for raising India's economic size itself. Second element of uh, the Ministry of External Affairs, uh, I think that is again interesting, but uh, perhaps a government has underlined the priority in that sense because this compared to defense budget being nearly 2% 2 2 of GDP, MEA's budget is roughly around 0.4% uh, of the GDP in that sense is uh, extremely limited in that sense. But as uh, Professor Sangyukta Bhattacharji mentioned, foreign policy is basically the broad bandwidth is determined by Ministry of Foreign Affairs, but it's not, foreign policy is not conducted by Ministry of Foreign Affairs alone. There are a lot of other ministries like uh, uh, Commerce and Industry Ministry, for example, Science and Technology, Sports and Youth Affairs, even Tourism and Education, uh, they contribute a great deal to how foreign policy is implemented in that sense. So that has to be taken care of. Two things that I quickly want to underline uh, is one, that uh, given the situation of pandemic, Ministry of External Affairs last year could not even spend the money that was allocated to Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, the money that was uh, allocated was something like 17,250 crores and it could spend only 16,910 crores of rupees. So sometimes that also comes into the picture. So why you know, the increase is not as much? Uh, of course, this year they had increased, they've increased the budget uh, slightly, not very, very impressively. Uh, but two things that we have been hearing for a long time, and in fact, the 17th Lok Sabha Standing Committee had in their recommendations mentioned that there is an urgent need to expand MEA's budget. Uh, is what are we expecting MEA to do? Uh, long time debate about whether we need to expand numbers of our diplomatic cadre, uh, because countries that we are comparing ourselves with China and United States has roughly around maybe 10 times the workforce that works for them. In case of China, uh, Chinese Communist Party has a parallel you know, cadre that again works with the, uh, all countries. Uh, so it's, it's a very different kind of competition that Indian uh, the Ministry of External Affairs faces in that sense to deal with those situations. And this year, of course, India is looking at historic opportunity of a presidency of a G20, which is, as we keep always saying, 85% of global GDP, 75% of global trade. It's an inordinate group of six out of nine nuclear weapon states are there. So it's a very great opportunity for India to showcase that global leadership, of course, uh, Shanghai Cooperation Organization Presidency, uh, separate allocations, as was underlined, have been made for those responsibilities uh, to be uh, borne. And India now has also to push its trade and commerce is my second element, which Ministry of External Affairs has to again work to ensure that, you know, India, for example, had walked out of uh, the, the 15 nation RCEP, Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, and is now, for example, also 
and not too sure has opted out of the trade pillar of Indo-Pacific economic framework again. So if India has to really become much around the world, countries are now part of these regional economic frameworks, uh, regional uh, kind of economic alignments. Uh, India has to look at what to do. India's concerns have always been, uh, for example, India's uh, skilled manpower getting access in foreign, foreign markets, India's uh, uh, micro, small and medium industries being uh, sort of vulnerable, uh, uh, and of course, enormous trade deficits. Uh, budget seeks to address some of these issues so that India can engage with some of these major regional uh, uh, trade and commerce related alignments. Uh, MSMECs uh, were mentioned thrice, I think, in the speech by Nirmala Sitaraman. 9,000 crores are separately allocated to help them um, sort of be more competitive. Uh, and, you know, in that sense, uh, there are elements where India has to depend on Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, to help India to expand its trade and commerce. Um, um, India, as we know, has crossed now $400 billion of exports this year. Target is $470 billion. So in that sense, I think this kind of uh, how foreign policy can uh, help much more in economic diplomacy, uh, inordinate dependence on China, for example, 17% of India's imports are still coming from China despite all the tensions that we keep talking about. And lots of these are things that can be easily produced in India. So a lot of rectification, course correction uh, is something which will be required. And I think a lot of it is covered in the, in the budget that is presented for this year. Uh, but of course, uh, fundamental limitation when India wants to stand next to the United States and China as a major power in coming times, remains expanding the size of the pie. And I think that is where we have to focus as to how to increase India's GDP and how to achieve the target of 5 trillion economy by 2025, which seems not an easy target as of now. And once we are able to expand that GDP, of course, then more allocations can be made in all, all various sectors. Uh, so it's a kind of a mixed um, situation of a lot of uh, juggling that uh, the budget has done to satisfy as many pe sectors as possible. Uh, but I think a lot remains still, uh, you know, expected of how the coming budgets uh, would be uh, formulated and whether priorities could be identified. Uh, to me, in terms of last word of on innovation and the prioritization, uh, would mean a lot of uh, infusion uh, with the civil society and uh, media and think tanks like yours uh, for uh, foreign policy and lots and lots of uh, you know, private public partnership when it comes to defense. Uh, some of it is already being tried, but I think a lot of bold initiatives would, re would be required in, in uh, co-opting some of these other stakeholders to be part of the national effort uh, to sort of, uh, you know, go towards becoming a major power in coming times, a major influence around uh, the world in coming times. And that is how budget could maximize uh, the, the output from even the limited resources. Uh, let me stop here and I look forward to listening to others. And if there are any comments and questions for me, I'll be happy to answer. Uh, back to sure. Sir. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much, sir. I just have a follow-up question on the um, before I uh, move to Mr. Robinder. Uh, my question is about the in, about increasing the MEA cadre, which you uh, mentioned in the passing. Um, so we have uh, really moved away from really increasing the number of uh, uh, foreign service officers uh, into recruiting consultants. And uh, even their tenure is uh, fixed, say for two years and then renewable for another two years. So is the task um, momentary? Is it transitory? And are we really attaining the objectives of um, promoting our or putting our uh, objectives of, um, uh, of being a global leader in that sense of the term by, by this kind of a temporary arrangement? Uh, thank you, Dawa. I look forward to listening to Mr. Sachdeva. I'll be very short in replying to you. Uh, yes, this has yes, been almost, yes. this is almost a decade 
that we have seen these efforts of uh, co-opting some of the younger uh, scholars as consultants or interns, um, mostly uh, not very streamlined, uh, as my experience with some of my students uh, have been. Uh, there should be uh, clearly defined responsibilities uh, given to uh, people who are co-opted like this. And greater reluctance has been in co-opting at senior level. The lateral entries that have been tried uh, in very, very few places have been extremely limited. I can understand that skepticism that uh, civil service sometimes has of people who are not kind of trained and uh, maybe tuned into thinking like uh, government officials. Uh, but uh, lateral entries are not supposed to do that. Lateral entries are supposed to be focused on a certain task and they are supposed to achieve that task. And I think a lot more streamlining of lateral entries at senior level and of course, co-option of lots and lots of short term, uh, just like we are talking of Agnivi uh, for armed forces, uh, you have to really streamline the role that you can give to a lot of younger, uh, bright scholars coming from various universities with their doctoral degrees. They can definitely make an enormous difference provided they are given responsibilities. Very often they are uh, kind of co-opted, but what they are supposed to do uh, is sometimes not very clear. Sometimes uh, some of these give a feedback that perhaps there's a trust issue, and there are issues of uh, uh, not of not giving access, etc. Uh, I have only heard these things, but I think that is where the uh, maximization of uh, output can be done. Efforts have also been made, for example, for about a decade now, the intake of uh, Indian Foreign Service has also been doubled. It used to be 15, uh, at some stage around 15 to now almost 35, 37. Uh, that's one part, but uh, I think just like you see a lot of uh, other countries, including United States, China, they depend on a lot of co-option on a short-term basis. And I think India has to really expand that and that actually gives a lot of flexibility to government to sort of let people go if they are not really worth uh, the kind of uh, the task they are assigned. And that flexibility, in fact, should be, you know, advantage of the government. And uh, I think th I agree with you, Nesimi, that that is where I think a lot of maximization uh, of uh, uh, what government can achieve uh, through innovation and prioritization, as General has mentioned, uh, can be can be done. And I think that's an excellent point you made. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. It has always been a delight to listen to you, whether here or in the classroom, as you've been my teacher in the School of International Studies in my MA days. Thank you so much, sir. I now move on to uh, Mr. Robinder Sachdev. Um, sir, uh, yes, you have a presentation to make. And uh, during the course of the presentation, if you could also throw some light on the uh, how on how the budget translates into attaining the objectives of diplomacy, especially given that this is the G20 presidency year for India and also that of um, SCO. Uh, so over to you. Thank you so much, Simi. I will try to cover Thank that you. point. OK, so Shall could we have a presentation, please? If you could start right. here, sure. Oh, yes, sir. OK, uh, thank you very much for organizing this uh, discussion and a pleasure to listen to, you know, eminent, eminent minds uh, before me. And I'm sure that the, in the audience also there are scholars and thinkers and uh, such who would be you know, listening to this discussion. So what I thought was actually to structure my talk. And in fact, if you see as all eminent scholars or teachers and professors before me have covered about the budget, so per chance, I've kind of, you know, not delved more into it. So let's get into what I thought to share. Okay, on optopolitics and on weaponizing peace. Next, please. A little bit about us, but the key point, what I want to say is that in my, this presentation, I'll highlight three intellectual constructs. Okay, which maybe could be of use, which maybe could be built upon, or which maybe could be deconstructed as not being viable, but I think worth tossing and testing. So there are three constructs that I will present. Next, please. Firstly, the future. I don't know, but overall in a big picture, if you see, I mean, I can one can anticipate that there is a third world war, a fourth and a fifth one. In a way, I feel the third world war is already on or whatever form or shape it may take. 
Next would be in the Indo-Pacific theater. And then a fifth one would come back to Europe. And that is the parallel of Germany, World War I, World War II. Russia defeated, humiliated, whatever, pygmyized, will have some kind of a renaissance, nationalism, et cetera, in 2025 20, years, it will come back to establish re itself. But who knows? So, but in a way, I mean, that's the world that we are in. So three constructs that I'll share would, would be, one is optopolitics, one is a lemonade mindset, and the third is weaponizing peace. And in fact, I think all of these to some extent or other have actually been referred by all eminent speakers before me. First one, optopolitics. You know, we use the term geopolitics, yeah, sure. But more and more, as we are seeing, it's becoming optics mixed with geopolitics, right? The optics or the narratives we get, the propagandas, what the media says, insufficient data, ground intelligence, a self-bias that we have when we process the information and all, all that is optics. So the world of today that we are seeing and dealing with, I think may be better looked upon if we look at it from a view of optopolitics, for example, in addition to geopolitics. An example of, you know, optopolitics, I would say this incident with the Chinese balloon. Okay, there's a lot of geopolitics happening between the US and China. Okay, and it is layered with propaganda about the other, the self, who is right, who is wrong, insufficient information and all. So what really is playing out in the world of today is optopolitics about the Chinese balloon incident. Next. The second construct. Uh, next slide, please. You've gone up. Yeah. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Now next. The next slide, please. Yeah, thank you. Now, this is something actually which has been mentioned by all our three speakers. And I'll identify what I mean to say is that. See, the lemonade mindset, the idea, the saying we all have heard often maybe is when life hands you a lemon, make lemonade. It is a mindset of motivation, creative thinking, jogar, frugal innovation, and hope. That, let's say that bundle of a mindset life has given us a lemon or life gives someone a lemon let us make lemonade or let me make lemonade so that's the mindset we have to get into next slide please so example the union budget as all eminent colleagues before me have mentioned that you know we have our own constraints okay and we have to try and make the best out of whatever we have and the main thing which everyone has highlighted is the fact that the key is economic growth. Our defense budget can only go up if our economy go, goes up. Okay. And as far as the budget is concerned, mostly it's tinkering. You know, the governments do not have much flexibility to allocate, let's say, a billion or a few or $10 billion into some new projects tomorrow. Most of the money goes into schemes, program, pensions, or, you know, ammunition programs, whatever you may say, salaries, already which is pre-decided. Or which has to be which is which has to be done, right? So there's very little leeway for any government to increase any much the budgets unless our economy improves. And the other one aspect I would so we have to make lemonade with whatever money we have, we have to make the best out of it. The second thing which I think uh, which General Chakravarti mentioned in terms of our defense industry and Arthur Nirvata and all, we have a problem, we have a structural problem. There is only one buyer for any defense item which is produced in India. So let's say there are three private companies all trying to figure out and make the best tank possible. The Indian government MOD will buy from only one of them. What happens to the investments of the other two? Private industry cannot do that. The way out, as General Chakravarti mentioned, is focus, focus on exports. And which I've mentioned in my note here, could be improved by similarly saying that creating consortium of buyers. India could link up with some friendly countries and okay, fine, three, four. And then whatever is made in India could also be offered to some such friendly countries. Thereby, our manufacturers here could have a bigger pie or could have a bigger uh, you know, pool where to sell potentially if their products are good. That is a problem for us and it will continue 
unless somehow or we just keep on stumbling along and keep making lemonade. Next, please. And I got only a few slides remaining. Construct three, weaponized peace. See, when we go to war or wherever we are, sure, we carry our guns and bombs and missiles and drones and AIs and all we have to do now. But in addition to it, I think we should carry a little weapon of peace in our back pockets. And I will give two examples right now. Objective of this is if we weaponize peace, you know, it's a tool. It's a tool to push the enemy, quote unquote, I'm using the term, on the back foot in the opto politics of today. It also helps our world image that apart from everything else, we are also talking or we have a model of a peace process or a peace deal. We have a model. It improves our image in the world. It also improves our image amongst the commons in the quote unquote enemy country or the other country, which bears ill intention to us. You know, it improves our image. Okay, these guys are at least also talking peace, maybe. And of course it can be used in negotiations, and sometime in the future, probably, who knows, it could yield peace dividends for us and the quote-unquote other country. So weaponizing peace is something we should look and toss out. Next slide, please. My, I have two examples here. My one example is, is it the time to drop a peace bomb on Pakistan? I will explain what I mean. Pakistan is in a deep economic crisis. IMF will not be able to help it out at all. This billion dollar here, there will be drip drip. After this, Pakistan has to go to the Paris Club, which has to get all its debtor countries, the Paris Club countries, to agree to a common formula for bailing out, okay, for taking a haircut. Countries of the Paris Club could take a haircut, but commercial lenders will not take a haircut. You know, the Goldman Sachs of the world, the vanguards, the Fidelity, all of these who have investments in Pakistan, they will not like to take a haircut. And IMF will start releasing money only once there is a call. All of these guys are on the same page. More on that later. Even now, Pakistan will have to reduce its military pensions and military budget. General Chakravarti was mentioning about Pakistan's military budget, maybe 3.5%. Pakistan, you know, very smartly, since Musharraf's time, does not include the military pensions under the military budget, defense budget. It has very smartly put that under the civil budget. Now, what IMF is asking Pakistan is that you bring that budget into your defense budget and overall cut down your defense budget. Then, of course, we know that. So how Pakistan would do that, we don't know, but it will have to do. Tax increases, we've heard, reduce government salaries and employees, staff. Pakistan has pledged portions of Karachi Airport, portions, portions of Lahore Airport, portions of toll roads. Pakistan Radio owns 61 buildings across the country. Portions of Pakistan Radio, the legal entity, have been pledged to lenders. These portions which have been you know, pledged would be taken over, over by lenders. Last June, Pakistan cabinet also approved that Karachi port, seaport, could also be pledged. Pakistan has already also pledged over two and a half billion dollars of its stock in its state-owned banks. Let's say like the State Bank of Pakistan. Shares of State Bank of Pakistan are pledged to some lenders. So some of these would have to be taken away. Some of these would have to be pledged further. So Pakistan is in a royal mess. Next, please, slide. I'll give an example of Sri Lanka to understand what's going to happen with Pakistan. Sri Lanka has still not received any IMF money. IMF money is contingent upon other lenders to Sri Lanka coming to a common page. Specifically in the case of Sri Lanka, it's India, Japan, and China. India and Japan are agreeing to a moratorium of 10 years or 15 years. China is not agreeing. China is asking for a moratorium of only two years. Till the time these three bilateral lenders agree, 
IMF is not going to release any loans to Sri Lanka. It is stuck. Sri Lanka has promised and is reducing its troops from 180,000 to 135,000 next year and will bring it down to 100,000 troops by the end of the next five years. Pakistan would need to maybe do something like this. Sri Lankan airline, Sri Lankan telecom are all on the chopping block. Sri Lanka has to reduce government staff, salaries, and of course, I'm not even going into the increase of taxes, income tax, personal tax, corporate tax, GST, et cetera. This is what's happening with Sri Lanka as of now. More or less a similar fate awaits Pakistan. Next slide, please. So is it time for, so my, my reading in this is that Pakistan, even this $1 billion with IMF will take it another few months. Pakistan, the next 10 years will be in a dark hole. Is it time for India to drop a peace bomb? Blue sky thinking, work back room with the IMF, with the US and Paris Club, India. Create a structure. And then India offers a deal to Pakistan. $5 billion immediate aid, or let's say $1 billion immediate and $4 billion within three months. Second, we declare a treaty of, or let's both, we will, subject to our conditions, a treaty of live and let live, Indo-Pakistan. And we will open trade and investments with Pakistan. The conditions we ask, reduce your defense budget by 30% within the next one year. In any case, IMF is going to ask them. Reduce your budget to 50% by the next five years. We are not your enemy. Give us a commitment in writing that you stop tom toming about Kashmir world over. It's over, it's past. Give us a commitment in writing that you will stop promoting cross-border terrorism. All national political parties of Pakistan have to sign up on this document. Advantages to Pakistan? Money will flow in. It will be able to reduce defense expense and put that, put that into more productive needs of the real country. Okay, education, healthcare, infrastructure, whatever, whatever, etc. And peace and long-term development. Why not? I mean, see, this are the kind of, you know, uh, potentialities we could look and think and explore. Next slide, please. And that's the last one, I think. Second, an example again of weaponizing peace. India-China Gardens of Peace. How and when will India and China have long-term peace? Maybe. The total length of the boundary itself is disputed. Keep aside Aksaijan and Arunachal Pradesh. The LSE is not defined. It's a meandering. We can imagine it as a meandering river. Somewhere it's 10 kilometers wide, somewhere 100 kilometers wide, somewhere 2 kilometers wide. So this width of the river is perhaps the LSE. There are about 40 to 45 points disputed along this LSE of varying widths, maybe. Can we both agree to define and create these disputed points as no man's lands, neither ours nor yours? So be it. Of course, we'll also look at our strategic interest and our military interest, our vantage points. We don't want to lose. China will also not want to lose. So there's going to be, going to be long, tough road. And firstly, will China... China does not even talk to us. And should we even propose this to China? No, because if we propose, then we sound maybe coming from a weaker position. But the point is we need to start carrying this in our back pocket as a long-term idea, ideation sometime. Could we start a pilot, let's say with Galwan? What's happening in Galwan? There's a standoff. They've retreated some, we've retreated some, we don't know who's where, etc. But all of this drama is happening within the LSE. Could we get commonly to agree to create this standoff zone where they're about five kilometers away from us and we have five and we are not patrolling or they're patrolling? Create it as a garden of peace, as a pilot project. Let us see. Weaponize peace. Thank you very much. Brilliant presentation, sir.
Yeah, amazing. It really uh, made me think about uh, the prospect of um, peace between India and Pakistan. But uh, I really doubt whether the hawks in both the countries sure. are really willing, and the politics especially. Um, may how, I? I agree. How would it? It, it may yes, not. Sir. But you know, this here is a community of strategic thinkers, long-term Absolutely. thinkers, right? We have to be toying and tossing these, and then you know, let's see who knows. And I completely, I mean, we much more than understand all of us here that you know these are impossible ideas, maybe, but. Uh, in fact, this uh, time to drop peace bomb on Pakistan. I'm, we are going to put out a press statement tomorrow on this. Amazing, amazing. I think uh, that is very important. At least make uh, that that conversation rolling, and uh, maybe this can be a part of the larger larger uh, agenda of Akhand Bharat. Who knows? So, thank you so much for that wonderful presentation. So, <laughs> I would, um, I would now. Uh, move on to one question that has come from uh, Satyam and um, uh, Satyam would you like to discuss this with uh, the panelist yourself um, okay so uh, I'll read the question India released a list banning certain weapon imports that are in the stages of development in India. Is it not impacting the defense preparedness in India? Uh, Major General, would you like to take this question? Thank you, Dr. Simi. Yes. Well, uh, let's be very clear. Uh, there are, we have drawn a list and these lists also have got a timeline by which we are supposed to be indigenizing. Uh, by no means are we saying that we are not going to import weapons at all. It's an, it's an impossible thing. I mean, say, I am talk, oh, we talk firstly and make it very simple. Let's talk about the United States. I'll just take two components. First is the iPad or Apple. 85% of the components are made in China. Boeing aircraft, 85% of the components are made in China. So when we say that what you call we make a list, you must look at the list in great details. It's only about say whatever the number, I would not like to get into it because everybody knows what the numbers are and the thing. By no means it's impacting us. You see, all said and done, unless you lay down for yourself that you are going to indigenize, like say, yes, it's so heartening to see that today your aircraft, your fighter aircraft, Tejas has landed on INS Vikrant. Yes, Vikrant. You must understand Vikrant is an aircraft carrier made by India. It's not Vikramaditya. Now it's a great thing to talk to anybody in the world for an air, fighter aircraft made in India to land. So this is what we are trying to achieve. By no means are we saying that we'll not get ultralight houses. By no means are we saying that we are going to not get imports. I mean to say, uh, Professor Swaran Singh rightly brought out how much imports we are getting from China. I think, and uh, from the United States, from everybody, we are getting a lot of imports. We cannot, it's, it's an interdependent world. And our armed forces are also dependent on many countries. Like, I mean, say, let's look at it today. Uh, the Ukraine war is on. We are all surviving because Russia is giving us energy at a price which makes it affordable for our economy to go on. It's nice for the sir to put on all these slides about Pakistan, China, peace. Well, I have spent my entire life, I mean, so it's just 55 years since I joined the National Defense Academy. Believe me, there's not been a night which I have not spent in only trying to get peace for our country. Every night I am writing or reading or speaking or telling or attending to military issues of military people. But let me put it to you. I mean to say, I, I just put it in very simple academic terms. The line of actual control is 3,488 kilometers as far as India is concerned. China says it's 2,000 kilometers. Now, you please tell me, where's the meeting point? Pakistan. I do remember before the 65 war, luckily I've seen all the prime ministers of the country. Believe me or not, I mean, 
one of the most fortunate persons to have seen this, seen them functioning and at a very young age, at the age of nine, I became a boarder in those days in India. My father sent me to a boarding school where English was being taught by people who came from England. And I may put it to you that very, very clearly, as far as Pakistan is concerned, I think I can straight away name that before the 65 war, they were economically far better than India. Ayub Khan, as per all records, did not want to attack India. The one man who ensured that both Bangladesh was created, the nuclear weapon was created, as well as the 1965 Operation Gibraltar and everything was done was Zulfikar Ali Bhutto. So when you have such people and he was educated in the United States and see all these economic figures since I have spent a lot of time abroad, I keep going abroad, I keep speaking abroad to military people, obviously. Let me put it to you, Nice to say that Pakistan will not live. I haven't seen any country packing up. These things keep happening. They live through it. I was surprised. I just, I always take what is the higher end. The number of BMWs going to Pakistan have rather increased in the last one month. Now, I mean to say you would agree it's something strange. Military people in Pakistan are still the richest and their relations are the richest. And last of all, to answer the question directly to the person, by no means are these lists going to impact defense preparedness. Rather, we would become much more prepared. The more you start you know, putting your own people onto getting some lists, we start working. And I think India needs somebody to always shake us up. Whenever I meet the Chinese, I thank them that you have really shaken us up and you have woken us up. I do not know whether the other panelists would agree. So therefore, these lists are very good to in simple question to answer everything. Right. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Major General. I would uh, request Professor Singh, um, Professor Swaran Singh. Um, so there is... Uh, uh, a curious question. In this uh, budget, Nirmala Sitharaman um, has mentioned about uh, setting up of border villages as tourist destinations. Uh, do you see something as uh, this, something as part of, uh, you know, a larger strategic objective, especially because infrastructure uh, expansion uh, features very aggressively in this budget? Is there something uh, deeper which we can read through and uh, you could help us through in this? Uh, thank you, uh, Simi. Uh, December of 2021, uh, China had passed a law on uh, land border uh, modernization. And uh, there are various reports that since then, or even before that, uh, about 600 plus such villages have been identified by China on the frontier. Uh, and a uh, lot of new construction um, uh, modern technologies, uh, communication, uh, road transport systems have been uh, strengthened. And that is clearly uh, as a result of uh, a simple thing that China for long period had a policy of two steps forward, one step backward with most of its neighbors. And South China Sea is perhaps the ideal example of how it has gradually captured enormous uh, uh, part of that territory using that strategy, except that this strategy has failed when it comes to its largest neighbor, India. Uh, India has stood up to China, especially uh, in about last decade or so. Uh, you know, Doklam and Galwan are great examples of uh, standing up to China and entire neighborhood is watching it, uh, which has led to China to look long term as to how this largest neighbor has to be tackled. And therefore, it is a kind of a contestation now in uh, tiring out uh, each other. And that would require a lot of support from the frontier areas. And frontier areas, as you understand, are largely the minorities of China, whereas the People's Liberation Army is largely the Han Chinese uh, armed forces, uh, not just in terms of loyalty, but in terms of acclimatization also. It's not easy for Han Chinese to stay on 
those uh, high altitude uh, kind of regions. And therefore, over a period of time, the support of people's armed police and people of these frontier areas uh, to be co-opted into uh, those uh, kind of uh, missions and assignments is why that kind of enormous effort has been made from the Chinese side. Uh, so staying power is important, uh, just like India is now staying in frontier areas. Uh, and that has obviously been responded by India as well, that uh, in India also, you know, despite all the limitations, General would vouch me that border areas, communities and people have been a backbone of armed forces uh, in many ways. Uh, and, you know, General can expand on that. I wouldn't like to say, uh, maybe many of you know in how many ways they are supporting Indian armed forces. Uh, so uh, providing better life to them, equipping them and connecting them better to India's overall posturing of uh, uh, you know, sort of strength of armed forces uh, is what uh, for a long time required this kind of not just simply you know road building and uh, communications and other things, but improving lives of people on frontier areas. And I think it's a very timely in that sense response to that new strategy where China is now trying not to do the old fashioned two steps forward, one step backward, but emphasize on its staying power and India has to respond to that staying power. And I think this is part of that strategy that India has started focusing on communities on the frontier areas also. Thank you, Simi, for asking that question. If you allow me about 10 to 15 seconds, I think Satyam's question is very interesting. But a lot of people perhaps think that when we emphasize too much on At Atma Nirvar Bharat, it means we are shutting doors on anyone else. As General said, this is not shutting doors on others. It's basically uh, focusing on niche advantages, areas where India can contribute in defense production. Uh, just like I was mentioning that a lot of what we buy from China can be produced locally. Uh, as you know, this is after Prime Minister's campaign for Atma Nirbhar Bharat that May last year, Prime Minister signed with Joe Biden something called India-US Initiative for Critical and Emerging Technologies. Uh, NSA Ajay Doval was, I think, only this week in Washington on the first meeting under this initiative on critical and emerging technologies between these two countries. General Electric is now going to produce engines for aircrafts, indigenous aircrafts in India. And despite half a century of license production with Russia, engines are the weakest link in India's defense production. I think General Electric is finally stepping into that. India is certainly, you know, you know, sort of semiconductor sector is uh, being co-opted and uh, experts from India are being going to be co-opted into American uh, production of semiconductor chips. So there is interdependence that is not going to disappear except that India wants to emphasize to identify niche areas where Indian defense production can happen only domestically. Uh, and also five seconds on Mr. Sajdev's point, I am happy he mentioned a peace bomb on Pakistan, that sentiment has to be repeatedly revised. And that's a good diplomatic posture. But of course, we have to understand that even in case of natural calamities, Pakistan is often reluctant to take Indian help when it happens even on areas where India is the immediate next door neighbor and can deliver, uh, even compared to Pakistan. So Pakistan will continue to have that reluctance, but that doesn't stop us from making these uh, gestures. Uh, and let us see how Pakistan responds. I remember Bajpayee had proposed no war pact. Nothing came out of it. Uh, but these are gestures that I think in diplomacy sometimes you make and they have their own relevance uh, with, of course, understanding that they may not be responded. Uh, so I'm happy that he made that uh, uh, comment of the peace bomb. <laughs> I like that expression. Thank you, Simi, and back to you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much for your response. Um, uh, I would uh, move to uh, Professor Sanjukta Bhattacharya just after Mr. Robinder Sachdev. Uh, Mr. Sachdev, there is a question, I think, if you could take this um, by Satyam, whether uh, about opening up of the defense sector for private players. Is it like the US kind of a model um, that has commercialized war for profit business via the arms lobby? Could you respond to this? Thank you. A couple of things. You see, I mean, the U.S. model of defense evolved over a period of time after the Second World War 
that was a very different era right the us government stepped in much they put in money into the r and d and they kind of you know prompted and promoted several companies private companies to come on take on and quite a you know quite a bit of a venture investment approach that was a very different era through which the us government you know was able to create the so called military industrial complex in the us uh in the world of today for us to create something like that i think is pretty difficult that's one secondly harking back yes to the point that you see when you produce when the us defense industry produces or even in the 60s 70s and all they had the wider world markets also right not only within the us domestic but the other world markets also so if some of the you know products are not doing well or taking off within the us maybe they could sell it to a germany or xyz i don't know whatever right that broadened the markets for the us in order to grow its military industrial complex that's one now secondly that uh, it has commercialized war for profit business well uh, india will not be in a position realistically speaking to create and to create wars across the world like the us does supposedly right or to create situations which cause wars india is not in that position honestly the us is in that position and sure when wars happen or are created yes differently is the us defense industry benefits by the way right now in this ukraine war we think that the us defense industry is benefiting hugely yes it will but at present right now this past year records there's a report in the wall street journal just two days ago lockheed martins and uh, the raytheons their profit numbers are not as not even as good some of them are on a loss right now issue is they're facing supply chain constraints they're facing labor issues so there's a lot happening there but yes the us defense industry will make big gains in this coming next year but this past year their financial numbers are not as one would estimate or as one is thinking so india cannot uh, be uh, is not in a position to be you know uh, participating or encouraging or taking one side or the other in multiple wars across the country which happened so india cannot adopt that model that uh, we go in somewhere we stoke some you know we stoke some passions one way or the other and the war breaks out and then we sell our arms to one side or the other we cannot i don't think so we can do something like that thank you so much sir um so um there's a question by samriddhi and uh, samriddhi would you like to uh, ask the question directly to professor singh yes unmute yourself please Yeah, quick hello yeah. sir uh, the question is slightly off topic but uh, it's about uh, kishida's decision you know and his government japan has decided to increase its defense spending and uh, there are some uh, major changes taking place in uh, you know japan's front recently so it's my question is how is it that how is that going to affect uh, india's security in the indo pacific and generally you know the general relation between india and japan and uh, japan stand japan's world stand just just a very general question so sorry no no thank you uh, smriti for that question i hope i can uh, answer uh, basically japan and india uh, have almost for two decades now uh, understood that china is their shared challenge and that has really over period of time uh, brought them closer uh, and therefore you would remember that shinzo abe's first speech on the confluence of two oceans happened in india's parliament from where this whole idea of indo pacific was to later expand and grow and idea of indo pacific again has brought not just japan and india closer but a whole range of other what i call united states friends and allies Uh, from australia philippines singapore and everybody else uh, right away to saudi arabia to canada where i'm sitting uh, all focusing on indo pacific and all of them feeling china as their shared common challenge uh, that is creating atmospherics where the continuous effort of japan and india to come closer to deal with their shared challenge uh, gets reinforced and facilitated 
uh, and that should help uh, these two countries really come closer. And now your point that you mentioned, uh, the two important reports that Kishida government had uh, uh, launched in December, uh, the uh, National Defense Report and National Security Report, uh, are fundamentally uh, saying that they are finally going to not just cross that traditional self-imposed limit of keeping defense budget under 1%, but actually take it to 2% by 2027 or so in five years. And they have actually in this year's budget earmarked uh, 1.58 billion US dollars to buy tomahawks from United States, which is going to be the first counter-strike weapon. You know, it's a national defense force that they have. Now they're going to be offensive but in, the, in terms of their capabilities. Uh, so Japan taking on this kind of uh, a new role uh, and willing to spend that kind of money uh, is going to really uh, make sure that the kind of uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, complementarity or reciprocity uh, or uh, jointmanship that has been built over two decades uh, between India and Japan uh, is able to maximize uh, how uh, we can ensure uh, our China challenge is uh, addressed, redressed, or restrained. Uh, so in that sense, I think uh, Japan is on the cusp of uh, transforming itself uh, as a you know normal nation, as they have been saying for almost last 15, 20 years. So once they actually happen to uh, make themselves as a normal nation, have a normal defense force, uh, given the size of their economy, five plus billion dollars, they should be able to spend a lot of money on defense as well. And I think that definitely the new avatar in that sense of Kishida government uh, is going to strengthen the bilateral relationship, is going to uh, perhaps also contribute to India's own redressal of its uh, defense and foreign policy challenges. Uh, you know, uh, hopefully, let us see. The G20 summit meeting, I think, is a historic opportunity here where India wants to launch itself as a global leader. And uh, a lot of that uh, reset will happen in uh, India's relations with many of these countries. and. Uh, all of these leaders will be sort of really showcasing how they look at India and what they expect from India and how India wishes to engage them. And in that set of leaders, India, Japan, I think has a really special equation built over the last 20 years. Thank you, Smriti. I hope I answered your question. Uh, but of course, it's an ongoing discussion. Back to Simi again. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, Professor Sanjukta Bhattacharya, my question to you is about the way forward in moving towards um, an, um, a budget uh, towards um, the defense and in the foreign policy aspects. Um, where do you see, uh, definitely you have highlighted all the gaps, um, you've highlighted the numbers in your presentation. So according to you, where could be, you know, where we could be moving in the next years taking perhaps um, lessons, drawing lessons from the gaps that are there in the present. So that overall objective is that this kind of a financial aid vacuum, you have uh, highlighted so many countries where the, uh, where the uh, contributions or aid to these countries have increased and also somewhere they have decreased. You highlighted um, Mauritius, Maldives in the Indian Ocean region and also Bhutan because of strategic re uh, reasons, especially guided by China. So how can we ensure that this kind of financial aid vacuum, if we cannot leverage, is not filled up by China in the coming uh, years? Ma'am, uh, yeah. uh, Yes. Uh, well, uh, the problem with uh, the financial, uh, the budget, union budget every year, uh, as I pointed out right in the beginning of uh, uh, well, my presentation, uh, is that there is, this issue of availability of funds, okay? Uh, funds are limited, all right? Taxes, non-tax revenue, and basically other means uh, uh, like disinvestment in, in the public sector, these kind of things which bring in the funds, which always uh, is there. Now, the problem is the demand is much more than the supply. So as a result, in fact, what you find is every time, uh, well, uh, expenditure, Trumps uh, income, okay, and so therefore the government is forced to borrow. Now, uh, when you are forced to borrow, there is this debt to GDP, or debt as such uh, 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 ratio, 
And we find that uh, since uh, 2020, the debt to GDP ratio for India has been around 83%. Now, so far as the World Bank is concerned, World Bank has basically stated that anything that is over 77% can be problematic, or debt assets. What we see in Sri Lanka and in Pakistan is that the debt to GDP or debt assets ratio has gone up much higher, and as a result, it's facing uh, well certain kinds of crisis. Now, the problem is when the debt to GDP ratio is so high, well, which means basically the well, in terms of rupees, we have a big budget, but in terms of dollars, we don't really have that kind of a big uh, budget. So it's from these limited resources that we have to will uh, prioritize or right, what is important and what is not. Now, the country itself is very important. Or right, what, what happens within the country, like for instance, the people of the country, the citizenry, as I said, people's first budget, or right, especially in the context of 2024 being an election year. So you say that how do we see the way forward or right, the future? The future is 24, 25, and 24 is an election year. All right. So how do you expect that basically countries, you know, the gaps which are there, where basically uh, in some critical areas like Bhutan and Maldives, uh, the allocation has increased, but then in other, it has decreased. Now, how do you expect that there'll be increase in these, or right, as such, in an election year, when actually the people, or right, of the country, well, and the various sevas that are being kind of promoted uh, by the government, these are more important for getting votes, all right. So money allocated to ministries which deal with poverty alleviation, with uh, you know agriculture, with uh, basically all these kind of things. Uh, well, mitigation of uh, the needs of the people. I mean the the demands of the people. All right. These are much more important. All right. In an election year, than all right foreign defense policy. Unless of course there's a war. Okay. So in that context, the way I see for the next year, I mean, I mean, immediate future, all right, I don't see that there'll be much more allocation, all right, as such, for, uh, and as I think Swaran pointed out, I mean, uh, what was, it was Swaran or was it uh, uh, Major General Chakravarti who pointed out that basically what was actually allocated last year was not actually spent, okay? The estimated amount, the estimated budget, all right, uh, well, it did not meet, okay, that which is already allocated, so therefore, this is not going to be a foreign policy or the MEA is not going to be a priority in the coming year, all right, as such. Later on, of course, when we go forward, further forward, all right, that is, as we said, as I said, but then, of course, the Modi government has to remain in power, all right, because if there is a change in government, all right, priorities will again change, all right. Uh, now, in fact, it's Atmanirvar Bharat, Clean Bharat, Swatch Bharat, this, all these kind of things, all these kind of Bharats, but another government, all right, uh, can have, you know, a very different agenda. And of course, then, okay, uh, the priorities will be different. How do, I, how do I see the way forward? Well, basically, it depends, all right, as to who wins the next elections. But in the next year, at least, foreign policy is not going to be that much of a priority. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, sir, ma'am, uh, Professor Major General Chakravarti, ma'am just mentioned about uh, the uh, lapsable budget. Um, so very quickly, if you could re respond to my uh, query on uh, there has been a there was a demand uh, from the forces that uh, they would want uh, uh, an unlapsable budget. So the unutilized part of the previous years could go on to the uh, next year, but that has not really, you know, received the attention which was needed. So what are your views quickly, if you could uh, respond? Uh, see, we are a democratic country. So if, if today, let's say, even I have to receive my pension, I'm just saying, it has to be approved. It has to be approved by what are known as a number of authorities who are today in very, very simplistic term known as audit authorities. Now, if you take the Army, Navy, Air Force, we have got the Ministry of Defense Finance, and we have got also the Ministry of Finance. Look at it. I mean, say it's so... It looks very simple that I want to buy a particular weapon. When I want to buy a weapon, that weapon firstly has to be approved within the armed forces. Then it has to be what you call, you know, a, a complete procedure, which would be much more than the Ramayana and Mahabharat combined has to be followed. Since I've been getting all these weapons, after that, it has to be approved 
at the level at which we, which normally is the CCS. Now CCS is known to all of you, the Cabinet Committee on Security. After that, the entire process has to be negotiated, drawn out, and then after that, the expenditure has to be passed by Ministry of Defense Finance and also by the Ministry of Finance. I mean, though you have budgeted it, ultimately when you're going to spend the money, these two organizations have to pass it. Let's say that they have budgeted that this much will be spent on foreign travel. But if today an individual from say the Navy wants to go or a ship wants to go abroad, it has to be again passed by the appropriate authority. So when we say that a part of the lapse budget must be what you call available, is certain amount which we have actually proposed to people to spend, but they have not yet approved. So what can we do? We cannot force the, what you call Ministry of Defense Finance or the Ministry of Finance that you approve it. We keep going to them, keep going to them. And they take uh, their, or they say the whole thing is under, there's a beautiful word in, in all democracies, it is under processing. I mean, say you can go to a bank also and say, has this been credited? Sir, it is under processing. So now if it is under processing, at least whatever has lapsed should be available in the next budget. Very logical. And that's what the, I mean, say this is not, this is common everywhere in all countries of the world. I mean, just since I keep meeting everybody, yes, it may not be in authoritarian countries like Pakistan, China, where, you know, the military has a greater say. But here we are dependent on every check, every amount has to be passed and then again investigated by an auditor. That is it right? Is it wrong? Is it this? Then only a Rafael can come in that. So the procedures involved is that among us, you can't imagine, I mean, it's, it will require about 10 discussions like these to understand what is the defense procurement procedure? What is the defense procedure, this thing? Believe me, it is equivalent to doing six PhDs. I'll just leave it as simple as that. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, sir. Thank you so much to Major General P.K. Chakravarti, Professor Swaran Singh, Mr. Robinder Sachdev, and Professor Sanjukta Bhattacharya. It has really been a very stimulating discussion today. And uh, of course, uh, it doesn't end and we can keep discussing about it um, from the time the budget is really implemented from 1st of April. So thank you so much. And I hand it over to FISA for the formal vote of thanks. This meeting is being recorded. Thank you, ma'am. So, uh, as we have come to the end of today's discussion, I, Fiza Mahajan, researcher at IMPRI, Impact and Policy Research Institute, would like to propose the formal vote of thanks on behalf of IMPRI, Center for International Relations and Strategic Studies, for today's deliberation, a panel discussion on defense, foreign policy, and union budget 2023-24. We are grateful to our moderator, Dr. Sini Mehta, and panelists, Professor Sanjukta Bhattacharya, Major General Dr. P.K. Chakrabarti, Professor Swaran Singh, and Mr. Robindaran Sachde for taking part in this discussion and enlightening us. We thank all of our participants who have raised pertinent questions and actively participated in today's deliberation. You may also find more discussions on international relations and foreign policy in our IMPRI web policy talk series, the state of international affairs, hashtag diplomacy dialogue, and other thematic series. We are grateful if you are watching us later on our YouTube channel or listening to us on our various podcasts or reading our publications. We hope you continue to join in future to IMPRI web policy talk series. We also invite you to see IMPRI's third annual series of thematic deliberations and analysis of union budget available on IMPRI's YouTube channel, Financial Year 2023-24, that were being organized from February 2nd to 7th, 2023. Wishing you all a very good evening. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.